Hello, I'm Gloria Riffey, and I'd like to welcome all of you uh, here today to uh, Hyde Park Bethlehem United Methodist Church. And now if you'll stand, if you're able, we'll do our call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Worship God in the mighty firmament. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise God with trumpet and horn. Worship God with and heart. Let the people of God sing their praise. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Worship God with strings and rice. Let the faithful join the strain. Praise God with flashing symbols. Praise God with beating drums. Praise the Lord. And now if you'll be seated for our opening prayer. Eternal God, who was and is and is to come, you are the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and end of all things. Come to us now in visions and dreams, that our eyes may see more than they see, and our hearts may love more than they love. Make yourself known to, known to us in this time of worship, for in you we live and move and have our being. Bring your kingdom here on earth, that all may know your glory and find the courage to face each day. We ask this in the name of the one who conquered the grave to bring us eternal life. Amen. <laughs> Do you ever have questions? Do you want to say? 
Our scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, and it follows up from last week. It's the 20th chapter, beginning with verse 19 through 31. Hear now God's word. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the mark of his hands and his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. 
And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his, of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Come, come Holy Spirit. Remove any doubts, remove any distractions, and help us to feel your peace as you are present in this place. Amen. Have you ever had doubts? I have. <clears throat> so how do we deal with doubts that creep into our lives? Because they do, don't they? If we take a look at Thomas, we begin to learn a little bit more about Jesus and our doubts. You might think it was easy. It's easier for the disciples. I mean, way back then, what did they have to doubt, right? But they did. So what does it take, what did it take for the disciples to believe, and what does it take for you and I to believe? What does it take? I think it's safe to say that all of us have doubts at some time or another. But today, today I want us to tackle doubts. Because the first step in doing that is admitting that we often have doubts. In Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, he says that there are three kinds of people that are in church. Those that are struggling with doubt right now, those who have no doubts presently, but you will struggle with doubts in the future, and those who will basically never have any doubts because they're brain dead. We fall into one of those three categories. Where are you following, falling in those categories? Jude, chapter 1, verse 22 says, Be merciful to those who doubt. If you find yourself in a place where you are doubting, you're doubting Methodism, you're doubting the denomination, you're doubting the leadership, you're doubting if Jesus can pull us out, if you are doubting, whatever you're doubting, I don't know what your doubts are, but you might be doubting. We all doubt. You might be doubting God yourself and your circumstances, but no matter what you and I are dealing with, we're not alone. And friends, we're in a safe place. James Dobson tells us of a story of a lady who was watching a, a caterpillar turn into a chrysalis. The chrysalis was in a cocoon, and it was time for the butterfly to emerge. She was so excited, days upon days of watching this transformation take place. So she watched as the tiny butterfly struggled. And before long, she thought, I'm just going to help it a little bit. So she got a very sharp knife, and she cut along the edge of the cocoon. The butterfly emerged, and it flew around for just a few seconds, and then it was stuck there. It didn't fly anymore. And eventually, it died. The lady discovered too late that in the struggle, in the struggle to get out of the cocoon is what makes the butterfly's wings strong enough for it to fly. 
So you see, struggles have purpose in not only a butterfly's life, but struggles and doubt have purpose in our life too. I have a feeling that God uses doubt in many of our lives, just like that cocoon. He forces us to struggle with the realities of our faith or our circumstances, not because he wants us to fail, but because he wants us to get stronger and he wants us to fly. So let's look at our scripture text this morning. In verses 24 and 25, it says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and I put my fingers where the nails were, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas was there. He was there when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He was there when Jesus healed. He was there to see the miracles. There's no question. Thomas doubted that Jesus was alive. He wanted physical proof. He wanted to be sure without a doubt. But what if we put ourselves in Thomas's situation? just for a few minutes. He was one of the 12 disciples. He had followed Jesus for three years. He was close to Jesus. He knew Jesus. He witnessed firsthand what Jesus had done. His divine power, his divine nature. He knew Christ's love personally. Thomas had to be heartbroken. He was distraught. He was confused. Earlier in chapter 20, we see that Jesus appears to his disciples, even though Thomas isn't there. And we don't know why. We can make some assumptions. The disciples were hiding. They were in fear behind locked doors, thinking that the Romans, the Jews, were going to come and get them next. They were scared for their lives. We would be too, right? Right? I mean, it wasn't too long ago we had an active shooter at Target, and then we had an employee at Kroger at Hyde Park in the, in the parking lot shooting someone. People, we have reason to be afraid sometimes, right? But you know what? <clears throat> I think, I think maybe Thomas was saying, I'm not going to be with them. Because if we divide, we can conquer. And if we're all in one place, how easy would it be for the authorities to come and just grab all of us? Maybe, maybe that's what Thomas was thinking. And maybe he needed time to think and sort things out. Maybe he needed to think about all that had happened. And he was trying to make sense of it all. We're not sure what Thomas was thinking, or why he wasn't there. But if you have doubts this morning, the best place for all of us to be is among believers, so that we can encourage one another, and we can sort it out. Sort those questions out. Thomas didn't stay away with his doubts. He came back. If you have questions, like Thomas. Be brave enough to come back and to ask and to see. Thomas Thomas came back to the group because he wanted answers. What answers are you looking for? I believe God can use our doubts to drive us to search for him. Two Christian authors that I enjoy reading were former doubters. As a matter of fact, one was an atheist and who, because of their doubts, set out to prove that Christianity was false. Lee Strobel and Josh McDowell both decided to search for the truth, and guess what they found? They found that their doubts were unfounded. They found Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. 
and now they are defenders of the faith. This morning, if you're struggling with your faith, I encourage you to make a choice to use those doubts to search for truth. Dig into God's word. Ask God to reveal himself to you in a way that will strengthen you and encourage you and put the right people in front of you, right? Get into fellowship with other people who can help you sort out the answers. God uses relationships to help us with our doubts. We can use common experiences in all the ways that God has shown up and moved and worked in our lives. Doubt is not a sin. Did you know that? I want to say that loud. Doubt is not a sin. But it can take us away from God. The question is, what are we doing about our doubts? Thomas wasn't kicked out because of his doubts. He chose to come back. He chose to be part of the fellowship, and he chose Christ to find his answers. In verse 26 and 27, we hear these words. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them, and he said, Peace, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, take your finger, put it here, see my hands, reach out and put your hand in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Did you catch that? Jesus' presence casts out doubt and it brings peace. Are you looking for some peace? I don't know how doubt finds its way into your life, into your thoughts, but normally, in my life, doubts come when things aren't going so great. How are we going to get through this? What are we going to do? Satan is our enemy, and Satan is the seed planter of doubts. Have you ever found that to be true in your life? You can't do that. There's no way that's going to be possible. Seeds of doubt. I remember being in my mid-30s when my dad died. He was 58. I had lots of questions. Why do you take the good ones, God? And why do you leave the nasty, awful people here? I asked that question. Why do people have to suffer and die? I asked that question. How is any of this fair? I ask that question. But you know what? Those questions led me deeper into my relationship with Jesus. And eventually, God called me into ministry. I wasn't asking to be called. It's a discernment process. What is God driving you to do in order to have a deeper relationship with him? What questions do you have? How well do you know God? Do you know that <clears throat> do you know that the book of Psalms is 60% written by people crying out to God? Read it. Even those in the past had the same feelings and experience that we all go through, especially during the hard and the difficult times. Oh God, why have you forsaken me? That's in Psalms. Where does my strength come from? My help comes from the Lord, Psalm 121. You know why I know the psalms by heart? Because I've cried out the same way the psalmist has. How am I going to get through this? This is too much. 
So when things begin to pile up on you, where do you go? When what you've always believed in is challenged, how can a sense of doubt bring you peace? What about, do you remember when you were a kid and you learned that there weren't tooth fairies? There wasn't an Easter bunny? There wasn't a Santa Claus? Well, I mean, like, if those things aren't real, then what is? I mean, what about the stuff in, in the dog treat bag? Everything is not packaged the way it seems. When students are in school, especially starting in junior high all the way through college, let me just tell you, your Christian beliefs are going to be challenged. What you think is going to be challenged throughout all of your life. If Jesus is love, then what does that look like and feel like? He gave us two, two laws to follow. Love God and love one another. What does that look like? How do we do that authentically and in real ways? We need to understand that having doubts is natural. But the real question is, what are you going to do about those doubts? Are you just going to shut your Bible and put it on a shelf and dust that thing off? Or are you going to open it up and are you going to dig and are you going to look? And who are you going to ask to help you to find answers? In our scripture text, Thomas went to be with the other disciples. He knew that something happened, but he wasn't quite sure how to put it together. And then Jesus showed up. Do you know that Jesus wants to show up in your life? He wants you to draw closer to him. And he wants you to feel that peace that passes our human understanding. Jesus shows up and he says, peace be with you. Could you use some of that Jesus peace in your life? Personally, there have been times when doubt worked its way into my life. Especially when I'm disappointed. Who in the world wants to waste their time and energy? Nobody. But we all have these inquiring minds, don't we? We just have the need to know. So what will you do when you have doubts? We need to seek God like we never sought him before. We need to pray. Pray for God's presence and his assurance. We need to pray for divine guidance and strength. And we need to know that we can persevere. We also need to pray for God's peace. And we need to stand on God's promise and know that God calls us, not because we are able, but because Christ is able through us. And we need to see how God is revealing himself through his word to us. God also puts people in our lives that are sensitive to his leading, and they encourage us. And they become instruments of God's peace and grace through their faithfulness. When we go through times of doubt, I want to challenge you. Cry out to God and see if God does not reveal himself to you. Jesus came to Thomas. Thomas put his finger right in his side and in his wounds. Jesus desires to help us overcome any doubts and to share our experiences with each other. Do you remember what Thomas said after he touched Jesus? My Lord, my God, he knew without a doubt. Jesus told him, he said, because you have seen me, you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet they believe. Friends, we need to make a public declaration. We need to believe. It seems the more truth we possess in our minds and our hearts, the less that doubt can remain there. In fact, when you and I grow and we believe God's truth, 
we become more valuable to him. Doubts do not have a chance against God's truth. Many of our doubts come from our insecurities. But when we let God teach us and help us to realize exactly how much he loves us, that love from God brings healing. And it transforms us into how we think about ourselves and eventually how we think about other people. God's word is formational truth. And just like Thomas, we need to make up our minds and get intimate with Jesus and let him teach us. Thomas declared that he had experienced Jesus. And then what did he do? He didn't keep it to himself. He traveled to India and he spread the good news. Have you ever wondered what turned the disciples from hiding into being brave men and women that went out before kings and authorities and declared the belief in Jesus Christ, they were willing to die for Christ. What is it that transformed them? It was truth. There's no doubt that Jesus is and was the Son of God. He's all that he's ever claimed to be. So how does your life become a living testimony instead of letting doubt run wild? What's your God story? How has God proven to you without a doubt that he is alive, that he is real, that he's working in your life? I want to pray a prayer that was written by a pastor in Denver, Colorado, and it's called The Doubter's Prayer. So let's pray. God, sometimes I'm not sure. I don't understand. I can't understand. I don't know what I'm supposed to understand. I'm trying to let go. I'm trying to hold on. I'm learning. I'm growing, stretching, leaving, coming, going. Lord, what do I leave behind? And what do I do to move forward? God, grow my faith, whatever that means. Not in humans, not in systems, not in when someone tells me to believe, but in you, the living God, the one who heals, the one who reveals, the one who restores, the one who turns this world upside down, the one who calls me to mercy and justice and love. The one who stirs us to move. Yeah, that's all I really want. More of you in me. More of you in us. Amen. Receive now the benediction. Seek truth. Seek Jesus. Seek God's word and his ways. Believe as you reach out and allow Jesus to touch you. Find peace.